All right, so this talk is about hacking your career. And I want you to just get ready for a little bit of self-reflection. And it's going to be OK. So I have a question. How many of you are building a product right now? Hands high? OK. And my answer is that all of you are engaged in building a product, and that product is you. That's who you are. So I just want you to think about yourself as the product. Think about yourself as a cereal box, just for a moment. Think about your, yourself as that very special cereal box that has already been plucked off the shelf, because you're so freaking special. And think about the choices out there. Because you're all product folks, and product folks are very used to forming hypotheses about what the product is. And I want you to start thinking about who you are as a product. And then engage in experiments. And, and based on those experiments, have results that inform you about how you could be an even better product in the future. And this iterates forever. That's how I want you to think about your career. You are the product. So this is the purely whitewashed version of my career. And I will reveal all the, the horrible, stupid stuff that I've done. But to look at it carefully, notice that I bounced back and forth. I was, at, I was building bang bang shoot 'em up games at Electronic Arts, rotting people's brains out. And then I was building kids educational software at the learning company, Mattel. And then I invented binge watching, which again, rots your freaking brains out. And then at Chegg, at, at, at this point, Chegg's helped students save about a billion dollars renting textbooks instead of buying them. And then the last three or four years, I've largely been teaching outside the classroom, which is what I'm doing tonight. So there's three chapters to my talk tonight. The first is about how do you position yourself? And I'm going to give you some very specific frameworks to think about your product and your leadership skills, and then how those progress over time. And then the second, I'm going to get you thinking about how do you experiment with some of these different ideas via side projects. And then the third, because you are not perfectly self-aware, and none of us are, I'm going to share with you something that's been incredibly helpful as a feedback system to me, which is this notion of a personal board of directors. So these are the three chapters that I'm going to go with tonight. I put this image here because when I first put this image on the interwebs, my daughter instantly retweeted this image instead. And this is just a note to please, please, please don't take me too seriously. I know my career very well, and I'm going to use it as a way to reflect on these different ideas. Um, but I've grown up with, this is my family. This is the, the pack. And they keep me very, very, very honest. And one of the things, when I start talking a little bit too much about my career and the fact it, it, my daughter will nicely point out that, Dad, you're a frickin' 57-year-old white male. And so this is my just one moment of privilege alert. Okay? So uh, I, I, I'm going to share with you my career, but I do spend lots of time talking with other folks to try to get in your shoes and, and try to be helpful. So that's really what I'm doing tonight. All right, so now I want to talk about this idea of positioning. It's really a marketing concept. And so I want to share with you a really straightforward positioning model. And I, I've been positioning myself for many years. This simple positioning model, if you're trying to position a product, the first thing you ask is, what is it? And then the second, or what are the benefits of this product to someone else? And then there's kind of a wonky idea, which is, what is this product's personality? And that describes how a person relates to it, how you hope your product will relate to other people. And this notion of positioning is, what's the spot that you, oper uh, that you hold in someone's mind? So Netflix, the, the positioning of that, and I hope you have found this to be true, the idea was we were building a TV and movie subscription service. And we wanted to provide a very clear benefit. It's fast, it's easy, it's entertaining, and it's a great value. That was the product that we were trying to deliver. This is the benefit of the service. And then if you met Netflix at a cocktail party, we were hoping you would say that that person was really friendly and straightforward. Does this feel like Netflix to you today? Eh, maybe. Okay, it's not, it's not way off base. So now I'm just going to share how I, I position myself. So this is me, Gibson Biddle, as a product leader exec who 
help startups with the proof of concept to scale. That's what I do. I look for startups with proof of concept, then I help them to grow. And then once there's two or 3,000 people, just shoot me. It's just way too big for me. And the benefits that, that I provide, I, I provide lots of strategic thinking, management, and leadership skills. And then to give you a sense of my personality, which is apparent, I try to do this in a very genuine, but I understand that I'm a bit weird and quirky. So this is how I self-describe myself so I can relate to other people. So the question is, how do you position yourself? And what I want to do is give you some frameworks to think about how you might answer this question. So here's Steve Jobs. I've, I've chosen somebody that all of you know, and uh, he's a well-established product leader. And what I want you thinking about are, what are his skills? And then a little bit more broadly, what are the skills of a product leader? What do you have to be skillful at in order to build great products that dent the universe? So this is where I'm hoping you will pull up Slido and answer the question, what are the skills of a product leader? And think a little bit about Steve Jobs and think a little bit more about other product leaders that you might know. And I will be patient with you. You can put in multiple responses. Go crazy, Peter. Okay, As many responses as you want. This is great. So I'm seeing the consumer science. I see the vision and visionary. I'm looking for the reality distortion of Steve Jobs. I'm seeing a lot of the empathy, understanding of customers. Stubborn when warranted. I love that. Lots of, I see him focus. I love that. Uncompromising. Oh, OCD. That's a good one. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> this is great, uh, and, and this is super helpful for me. So I, I have, uh, at this point, I've interviewed and hired like 500 product managers, and I just want to share the, the, the way that I answer this question. So on one side, I think about this concept of product skills, and on the other side, I think about these leadership skills. So you're all engaged in building products. There's skills that I think are super helpful in doing that. And then you're all growing up as leaders. So I also want you to think a little bit over as you, as you go forward in your career, what are those very specific leadership skills? If I am interviewing a head of marketing or a CEO or a head of product, I'm using the same list of leadership skills. So I want to give you a, a little glimpse of what both of these, these different lists looks like. So this is Aparna C. She's the VP of product for AI at Google. I'm not very good at pronouncing her full last name, so I just call her Parna C. Um, but the skills that, that, that I think about when I'm evaluating product leaders are these. And I want you thinking, every time I'm sharing these lists, what are my top two or three skills? Because that's what's going to help you to position yourself. So when I say technical, what I mean is you work effectively with engineers. Newsflash, uh, I am an English major. I just happen to work very effectively with engineers. And then management, when you're engaged in building products, it's delivering this, this light process that, that lets you build stuff to deliver results. And then creativity is the lifeblood of what we do. So a highly creative person generates ideas that matter. And then it's important to create shareholder value. If you're building a product that delivers profits, then you can engage to build more stuff in the future. And to do that, you have to deliver profit or shareholder value. And then if it's not clear to you, I think that it's important that product leaders can package and position ideas in ways that resonate with customers. And then design has been super important, but it got a lot harder and more important when these mobile devices came out. And the idea of creating really simple experiences got really hard. So design has been increasingly important in the last 10 or 15 years. And then this notion of consumer science is you develop consumer insight via qualitative focus groups. This is all the world of empathy hiding in here through survey, through data, and A-B testing. Consumer science became a big dog in the last 10 years. And it's really been exciting in, in the opportunity to build cool stuff. So these are the seven skills that I, that I look for when I'm evaluating product leaders. And actually, the first thing I'll do is I'll put these words on a whiteboard. 
And before I even talk about what I'm looking for, I'll ask someone to force rank them. What, what are your superpowers? The one or two or three skills at the top of the list. So I want you thinking about this. On the other side of the ledger, these leadership skills, there's another seven here. So when I say leadership, what I mean is inspired communication of a vision. Steve Jobs was remarkably good at that. And as you grow up into a leader, management is now about hiring, firing, and developing teams. It's a little bit different. And then you learn the value of strategic thinking. My definition is when you're building products, how do you delight customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways? And then there are different styles of leaders. So results oriented, those are the folks that are incredibly proactive. They do whatever it takes. I've worked for a number of CEOs like that. They would sell the chairs every quarter to meet the revenue, which wasn't healthy for building a great company. And the other side of this, this results orientation is this notion of culture. That on one hand, you're a good fit for the company's culture, but also you understand as a leader that, that focusing on culture is an amazing way to, to help people make decisions without even talking to each other, for th this idea of light process. And then another thing I look for, I call it business maturity. It's a little sad to me. It doesn't correlate with age quite as much as I hope. But the idea is that you have great judgment around people, product, and business. You know, I'd argue that Mark Zuckerberg had uncommon judgment at age 22 and maybe went off the rails at age 29. You know, this is the negative correlation. And then the last idea is domain expertise. Uh, I'm expert at taking startups with proof of concept and then scaling them. That's the stage that I love to work with. And I work in two areas. One is education and, and the other one is entertainment. I can do both. So everyone's different. How many of you use, use Slack? Ah, OK. So this is April Underwood. She, she ran product at Slack until about six months ago. Now she's a, a VC. But when I asked April, hey, April, what are your top three skills uh, on the product list? She said, well, I grew up as an engineer. I'm highly technical. I care a lot about the business, and I actually understand how important it is to package and position ideas in ways that are relevant. This is April, her self-evaluation against this product skills list. And then I asked her the same question. She says, I'm intensely strategic, and I am incredibly results-oriented. And I actually think I have strong business maturity around people, product, and the business. So this is her self-evaluation. If you looked carefully at how I packaged and positioned myself, I'm all about the business and marketing and this consumer science, the better living through A-B testing. This is me. This is how I position myself. And on the leadership side of the equation, I'm all about the inspired communication of a vision of building great teams that can dent the universe. And then I think a lot about strategy. This, this is how I position myself. And these are the skills that, that I've developed over time. I'm really not very good at punk startups because I don't have a strong enough results orientation, right? I overthink things. I care too much about culture when there are only six people, right? I'm not good at everything, okay? So this is just how it works for me. So I want you thinking about what are your superpowers? By the way, I've sort of learned to really focus on just getting better at the things I'm good at and not worrying about the things that I suck at. And this is part of the notion of superpowers. So I want you to, here are the skills, and then we're going to use Slido to get your little assessment. So here are the product skills. You can pick two or three, because I'm trying to read the room and understand which areas you guys are strong in. Are you doing the work, Peter? Yeah, I'm picking on Peter, because he's the, he's the CEO of Slido. And Brad Crispin in the front row is like, thank God he's not picking on me. <laughs> yeah, he was thinking that until about two seconds ago. <laughs> I'm just very curious to see what we get here. How, how's the team Holt doing? You guys good? You, how, how many did you do? Two or three? You went crazy. Good, good. 
Okay, well, I'm learning a lot about the room. So there's a strong business orientation, a little lighter on design. I actually did this two nights ago, and I actually got a very different room full of people, which is fascinating. Even higher on business. Oh, is, is one of these skills inherently better or worse than the other? I don't think so. This is just you trying to figure out how to position yourself. OK, so I'm going to go to the other side of the list. This is the, what are your top two to three leadership skills? So far, we've got a lot of strategic thinkers. <laughs> N is 10. Oh, we just went to 21. That's cool. So I keep all this data. It's super helpful to me. I sell it for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. OK, we've got a lot of strategic thinkers in the room. Uh, your self-evaluation on business maturity is a little lighter. It doesn't surprise me. I, I see lots of strong results orientation in, in most of the rooms that I talk to. Okay, so this is the genesis of how do you think about how to position yourself. The good news in this is you don't have to learn all these skills overnight. You have time. And what I'm going to do is share what careers look like. So at the beginning, you're just building something, anything. And then over time, you might aspire to build an industry. So I'm going to share how it played out for me. This is the first thing that I built. This, is Seg this was on the Sega Genesis. It's Sesame Street Counting Cafe. And I'm confident that no one in the room has used it or played it, uh, because we sold a whopping 300 units. And, it's, and, 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 and I spent $300,000 building it. Okay? This is not good. But I learned how to build something. I got engineers and designers, data scientists working together to build something. And then I learned a lot. I learned like you need to be clear about getting the right product for the right platform, right? Now I also worked on Oregon Trails. Anybody out there? Yeah, okay, good. That was that worked out much better. Okay, well here's my first hit. This was Sesame Street Elmo's preschool. This is a full preschool curriculum for two, three, and four-year-olds. Parents were very willing to spend money on that. And this was, this was the number one hit product of like, this is on CD-ROMs on like 1997. It was also the year that Oprah Winfrey threw Tickle Me Elmo's into the audience. And that's just called good luck, okay? Which is awesome. Okay, and then over time, I, I built lots of kids' software based on well-known brands. So I was working with all of these brands, and I found my job was actually building an organization building teams of people that could build multiple products. I was now a little bit further from getting my hands dirty on building one product at a time. I was very engaged in building an organization. And then I, I've had a hand in building, Creative Wonders was my first startup. I was a co-founder there. That, that was the one making all the kids' software. Uh, and then I've engaged with all of these companies. And then when I joined Netflix, my aspiration, it was a, a DVD by mail company. But the aspiration was to build a new industry, and that industry is, is streaming. And, and that worked out. So how many of you have used House of Cards? OK. Not played it. Watched it. That's the word. <laughs> Got it. So, and, and so the way you think about the skill development over time is at the beginning, the building something, it's about basic design and management, bringing together these different skills to actually build something. And the, the main thing that I had learned when I developed a hit was having some better knowledge of marketing and also of consumer insight. And then in, when you get engaged in building an organization, now you're beginning to see how important leadership and strategy and hiring and culture is. And then as you start building a company, like I was the head of product and I used to refer to my CFO partner as that bastard. Okay? Not a good thing to do. And this is when I began to learn that when you're, when you're building a company, it's all about cross-functional leadership, that you have to get wonderfully aligned with these other groups and departments. And then I start engaging in ideas of company strategy. And now think about what it is to create an industry of streaming. That was all about having a long-term strategy about how do you convince every TV manufacturer or Blu-ray manufacturer in the world to stream Netflix. That's the value of the long-term strategy and then the partnerships all over the world, because you can't build an industry on your own. So what I want you thinking about is, at what stage am I in my career right now? 
you know, I'm, am I in the something, or am I engaged in the hit part, or am I actually engaged in building organizations, or what stage are you in this? And that's the question I pose of you, because I really want to know, <coughs> okay? What's your answer, Peter? Industry. industry, okay, he's thinking big, great. What's the industry called? Okay, good, you better name it soon, dude. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Shorter, funnier, that'd be good. Brad, where are you? Uh, I'm leaning towards industry, but I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. Well, I actually love the, the, the uh, I expected this to be a pyramid, um, but I've got some aggressive folks that are engaged in building an industry, which is awesome. Again, think about how this positions you as a leader. This is all about packaging and positioning yourself. I think you're doing great so far. Okay, so now we've talked about how do you package and position yourself? How do you think about yourself in a product? And now you're gonna experiment with these different ideas. Huh, how's that work? So a couple, I, I, I gave you the, the sanitized version of my career. Now I'm gonna give you a little bit more truth. So um, that one of the things that I've learned, I have been fired. I have been laid off, I have run out of money, all sorts of crazy things have happened in my career. And because of this, I, I, I'm not one to go down the, the, the tracks. You know, I, I'm much better at operating out to the left or the right, and which is super helpful for me, because care careers are not linear paths, okay? Newsflash, LinkedIn has all of our data, right? And they look carefully at, at how do people grow into CEOs? And it's not this, ladder. It's this meandering weird path. They start answering customer support calls and then they go into marketing and then they go into sales and then they're in finance and then they're back here and they develop all those cross-functional leadership skills which eventually let them become the CEO. It, frankly, it resembles shoots and ladders. Do you know that game? Like occasionally you take a tumble. I, I, I have taken many tumbles. This is what careers really look like. I love Google, because when I search for fork in the road on Google, this is freaking what I got. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. But the concept is you have these moments in your career where you have to form hypotheses, just like building a product. Like, these were some issues that I was thinking about in my 20s and 30s. Am I a marketing person? By the way, I started in marketing. Or do I want to build product? Do I think of myself as a starter, early stage, or do I like to join a little sooner and help build things up? Am I a consumer software person or enterprise? Do I would like to do entertainment or education? These are all the questions, the hypotheses, the forks in the road that I had to navigate over time. Collect data, try experiments to, to get to the answer. And I'll share the answer. So just a couple things about my career. I, I came to uh, San Francisco because I love to windsurf and sail. And I was engaged, I took a year off from college, and I ran the J-World Sailing School out here. And then the, in the, we paid ourselves exactly $12,000 a year, and I loved it. But I, the main thing is I discovered San Francisco, which has been great for the kind of career I'm engaged in. And this is my first job out of college. I worked in the mailroom at an ad agency because I wanted to be in a creative industry. And I got paid, again, $12,000 a year. What was funny is my wife, I, I met her, we got married, and it was like two years later, she's like, what did you do in the mailroom? I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean, what did you do? I delivered mail. She's like, I thought you did like computer stuff. I'm like, no, I delivered mail. This, so this is how it starts. And then after a bunch of years, I wanted to shift out of ad into consumer tech. So I went to business school at, at Dartmouth at Tuck. What was really going on is I was looking for business schools with ski areas. And Dartmouth had one. Uh, and this was me and my now wife, Kristen. And these styles are coming back, damn it. <laughs> okay, how many know what HyperCard in, is in the room? Two, cool. HyperCard was one of the first uh, sort of object-oriented programming environments, and I was hacking using HyperCard at two in the morning. I had finished my cases and my homework for school, and I was building prototypes for kids' educational software, which I just loved. And that was sort of a clue about what I might want to do. 
And as a summer intern between years of business school, I, I was in market intelligence at IBM, which really meant I was researching where did I want to work when I graduated. So I created a list, and one of those companies was Electronic Arts. So I joined there upon graduation. I was in marketing, and at some point I switched over to product because I thought it might be fun, and it was. And then just to know me and my family, my wife's trying to cure cancer, so she holds me to a much higher standard. Okay? It's like, give your freaking reading, you know, rotting people's brains out. And that, every five years, she forced me back to doing good for the world through education. So after five years of bang, bang, shoot them up, I switched over to kids. Recognize this dude? Yeah. Okay, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank. Sold that company, Creative Wonders, to him. And this is how Kevin made his money. We sold the learning company to Mattel. I didn't get the, the money. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, and then this is my first internet startup. It's called FamilyWonder.com. If you look carefully, anytime you see bitmapped images, it's like that's a clue that maybe it didn't work out. Okay? <laughs> and this did not work out. And then look at, carefully at this one. This is with folks with uh, dyslexia. This is a neuro performance startup. Now look carefully. Do you think this worked out? <laughs> this did not work out. <laughs> You know, look carefully at my LinkedIn profile, okay? You see the middle thing called consultant? That is total bullshit, okay? <laughs> That's totally papering over just the disasters that I just shared with you, okay? This is what real careers look like, okay? And then this worked out, cool. And then I was really eager to help take an education company public, and this was... Most people would observe this as a very exciting moment. And I really was incredibly unhappy. And that's me on the left. You'll notice I didn't bother to buy a suit. Um, but the company went public, and, and I'll, I'll reveal a little later why I was so unhappy. But in this journey, I answered these hypotheses. I, I love to build product, and I'm not a, an early stage startup person. I'm a builder. I love to scale companies. I look for the startup with proof of concept. I love, love, love consumer. And it's OK that I do both. I didn't have to decide. Turns out you get paid more for entertainment and less for education, which is why I go back and forth. It's, all, it's OK. And then I stopped working for direct deposit three years ago. And then I, I, I've just been doing tons of experimentation. So what I discovered is I, I, I wanted more flexibility in my life. I worked one year at each of these companies as a three-day-a-week product leader, which most people thought would never work, and it worked incredibly well. And this is me just hacking my career, experimenting with different ideas. And it was great fun. So these were the hypotheses I had three or four years ago. Did I want to be a product leader, or did I want to be a CEO? Did I want to work full-time or part-time? Did I want to do what other white 57-year-old males do, which is be an advisor, a board member, or VC? Expected path, right? Or did I want to teach inside the building? I, I, I taught every fall at Stanford or outside the building. These were all the questions. And through a bunch of experimentation, here are the answers. And I'll give you a little insight about how I came to each of these in a moment. But I just love to teach via talks, workshops, and writing outside. And, and I experimented with all the stuff in white, and it just was not for me. So the question is, what are your career hypotheses? Right? That's what I want you thinking about. And I can help you frame it just a little bit. What are your areas of interest or passion? What are you really interested in? Remember my two in the morning building hypercard kid programming things? What are your possible forks in the road? Do I want to be a data scientist or do I want to be an engineer? Do I want to work at a punk startup or something a little bit further along? These are the kinds of questions that I want you to ask. Do you want to go into a new role? I mean, Brad is in the front seat because he was like a VP of finance who decided he wanted to be an engineer, correct? That's right. And, and he figured out how to make the transition. And it was painful, right? It was extremely, it was extremely painful. painful. Was, was it worthwhile? Absolutely. Okay. So that's a very brave and aggressive transition. Peter from Slido wants to be a ballet dancer. No, that's a joke. <laughs> Anyway, think about this, OK? And think long term. And, and most of us aren't very good at thinking. Like, 
I, I, I'm just trying to open your eyes to think about your career for a moment. And most of you might think about a year, but what would happen if you taught five or 10 or 15 years out? In five or 10 or 15 years, anything is possible. That's why I want you to take a moment to think long term. You can transition from finance to engineering if you give yourself the space of five years. That's probably what it took you, right? A little less. A little less, OK. But it was painful. OK, so you're career hackers. You have your hypotheses, and you want to experiment with side projects. You want to meet people in different industries, figure out what's for you. But in the course of a career, what's the right metric to evaluate whether you're succeeding or failing in, in your career? What would the metrics be? This is a real question now. So what are your real answers? What do I measure? Happy. Happiness. Javed wants to measure how satisfied are you in your current role. That's a great metric. What else could we measure? Impact. Impact. Are we doing good for the world? Are we helping to dent the universe? Are we rotting people's brains out or helping people to learn? What else can we measure? Sleep. Quality of sleep. <laughs> That's good. I'm sure it's correlated to some flavor of, of satisfaction. What was yours? Self-respect. Self-respect. How do you feel about the work that you're doing? Learning. What, what? Learning. Learning. Are you learning? These are all good ones. OK, so I'm going to share with you graphs of my entire career. I'm going to just put way too much information out there. So my first one, this is what income looks like. I'm a little surprised none of you brought money up because you don't care about it, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. OK, so newsflash, um, sailing schools and mailrooms are not really income generating things. Okay? And then you can see me growing up. And look at that, the deep, fallow trench here. Remember, remember consulting? Not, <laughs> not good. But notice I didn't, I didn't go into prison. Like My graph continued afterwards as I joined Netflix. And then, yeah, I took a hit when I went over to Chegg, and then got good, and then I took a hit, and now I'm growing again. Okay? So this is one measure, income. Javed was asking, gosh, think about this. On a scale of 0 to 10, right now, where 0 sucks and 10 is awesome, what's your current job satisfaction? So I've been graphing that for many, many, many years. And it kind of dolphins. Okay? So I joined Netflix, and I was learning a lot, and it was awesome. And then I started getting that feeling that I'm at a too big a company. And guess what? I probably don't have the right skills for the next wave. This is me going from zero, 1 million customers to 20 million. I took one statistics course in business school. Thank God. But my assessment was that the, to be an effective product leader at Netflix, I'd have to be like, a PhD in statistics to do all the machine learning. Like At that point, I, I wasn't the right person for the job. And I went over to Chegg. I was super happy, but then I got frustrated by the rate of change in education. It, does, it doesn't move and change as much as I like. So that's why I was so unhappy when we took the company public. And you could tell my job sat is ex excellent now. Okay, It's all good. OK, so the next one, this is my wife evaluating whether the work that I was doing was good for the world. <laughs> she said, OK, Gib, you were pretty good when you were building all the education stuff and the binge watching thing, not so good. Okay? And then rock on and helping students save tons of money renting instead of buying. And she actually loves what I'm doing right now. Okay? This is impact. So those are three ways you can measure as a career hacker what you should do. The, my main thing is you got to make sure that your current job satisfaction is eight or above. If it falls to five or six, like we all have bad days and bad weeks and bad months, but if you find over the course of six or 12 months that you're substantially below this eight, then you need to be thinking about what you might change. Maybe you work in a different role within the same company. Maybe you go to a different company. I don't know. You're going to have to form some of these hypotheses. But you got to make sure 
It's an eight. And nine is better. And 10 is really awesome. What's your number right now? Eight. Eight. Safe answer. <laughs> OK. I'm going to let the rest of you answer this number anonymously. Uh, I really want to know. I love that the happy people answer very quickly. <laughs> This is anonymous, I mean, truly, right, Peter? OK. <laughs> Thank God. And the clever among you might notice that I structured the data to get a net promoter score for the room. I want to know what the room's NPS is for their current job set. And, and the clever people know that the calculation for NPS is you take the percentage of folks with a 9 or a 10, which is 20%, and you subtract the folks that are unhappy, which is 40%. By the way, NPS is negative all the time. So the room for you is negative 20, okay? which means there are a lot of you in the room that need to be thinking about this. Be thinking about what might I change over the next 6, 12, or 18 months so that I, I have a substantially higher odds of having an 8 or above. How's your new boss treating you, Brad? OK, good. That's great. OK, so now I need a little bit more insight. I wasn't surprised by the negative 20. This is a typical number. So I just want to understand from you what could be better about your job. I want a little insight. This is really incredibly helpful for me uh, to understand what could make your job better. Now you guys are interested in the money. <laughs> I saw the, I, I realized these events, um, there are folks in the room that are actively networking, which I love, to find their next job. So I saw the have a job would make me happier, which is good. OK, you want more flexibility? You're like, oh, that three day a week thing? That sounded pretty good, Gib. Tell me more. Good, you, you probably want more responsibility. I see some, you want more ownership over what you're doing. You want to feel supported. You want to feel like you're learning. This is all excellent. This is great. Incredibly helpful. OK, that gives me a lot more insight about the zeros to sixes. All right, so some tips on career hacking. Uh, you need to be bold. And I'm going to give you some, some ideas about how to be a little bolder. Think about these hypotheses, these what might I be doing 6, 12, or 18? Over 5 or 10 years, what are my forks in the roads? And then experiments. It, it can begin as a simple thing. Just to talk to, if you're interested in data science, talk to a data scientist about their job. If you're in finance and interested in engineering, talk to engineers and find out what the job really is. Ask them what skills they need to develop and how, right? These, these are the beginnings of experiments, if you will. Think about those things that really are inspiring, that you're passionate about, that it, you might find yourself engaged in at 2 in the morning, and it can't be binge watching, right? But what are those things that really, really float your boat, that you really engage in? And then find ways to engage in side projects, little tests and experiments. If you stopped watching Netflix for a month, I suspect you'd find some time to, to engage in some of experiments and these ideas that, that you're interested in. And I, I still believe in, in chasing things you're passionate about, because that inspires the curiosity. And curiosity drives grit. And all employers want to hire people that are intellectually curious and, and are, are just determined to, to make things happen. Um, so I'm still a believer in, in chasing these ideas that you're curious about. So what enables risk? Education. Right? And education isn't about going to, to school or business school. There's a zillion ways that we can all learn about new things at any time of day. So I, Brad is at Udacity, correct? And, and that was the platform that you learned how to write code on. Is that correct? For the most part. For the most part. He also used Coursera a lot. Not true. Yeah, yeah. That was a joke that nobody understood. Those are the least funny jokes. Small successes. Like, I got a clue that maybe I wanted to build kids' software because I, I actually was able to build these hypercard programs. Just a little sign, and that kept me going. 
a simple life. My wife and I bought a house in 1991, and we still live in that same house. We just kept our lives simple to give us more opportunity to take on risk. So we didn't have to worry about paying for fancy cars or fancy houses. We own two very non-fancy Priuses, although my Stanford students still say that is bougie. So they give me no credit. Because I have found myself without a job so often, I've gotten really good at job hunting. And I call it career hunting. I wrote an essay. It's, it's good. It's like how to find a great job. But I list all the detailed tactics to doing that. But if you are confident that you could find that next great thing, it helps you to take on a lot more risk. All right. So I've talked about how to package and position yourself, some ways to take an experimental approach to your career, to engage in this career hacking. And then I just want to give you the, the, the most important feedback system that I have found. It's not quite the equivalent of A-B testing, but it's been incredibly impactful. And I have had my own personal board of directors for the last 15 or 20 years, and they've given me amazing insight. This is what they look like. They change over time. I, I meet with some of them once a year. I do emails occasionally, six months. It's very, like, not all of them know they're on my board of directors. But if you look carefully, uh, Mark Randolph is a speaker and a writer. He just wrote his first book. He is the co-founder of Netflix. He's also a teacher. Um, and Barry's on the right, and Dan Olson's there. These are all people that are doing what I started to do two or three years ago. I reached out to them and said, how does it work? How do you get talking gigs? How do you figure out what to write about? Um, Sarah and Ha, they're community leaders. We work together on a bunch of stuff. Okay? These folks are really helpful. I reach out to them when I'm like, I don't know what to do. And they're incredibly helpful to me. This is my board of directors. Greg Bestick was my first boss. I didn't really understand how to build stuff. He was a CEO. I said, Greg, how do I learn to build stuff? And he said, I have no freaking idea. Okay? Well, that's not helpful. What he said was, go out and build your community of peers. Every month, have lunch with the product leaders at all the other education startups. And that's how you're going to learn to, to do your job. It was incredibly helpful. I have been building my community of peers now for 20 years. Incredibly helpful. Like going through the transition from, oh gosh, at some point, web and mobile web and apps. Like I could text 12 friends, and they'd tell me exactly what percentage of use was on each of those three platforms. An incredibly helpful insight on any question I had. So I went to Amherst College. It's a little liberal arts school in Massachusetts. It only has 2,000 people. So the cool thing is when you reach out to them, they're helpful. Uh, so Ron Hoag, he looked at my early startups, and he said, Gib, I'm not sure if you were just lucky, right place at the right time, but why don't you join something that's a little further along that you think is a good company, and you can help make it great. And that's what led me to, to when I joined Netflix, it was actually quite a bit bigger than I was comfortable with. It was like 125 people. Uh, but it was his advice that chose me to look at this thing, which is bigger than what I usually started with. Incredibly helpful. Again, another Amherst person, uh, Irv Grosbeck, he created an industry called cable TV. That was his startup. And he's now a buck a year professor at, of entrepreneurship at Stanford. And so I would meet with him about once a year sit there, have a little 30-minute office hours. And Irv said, hey, Gib, can I tell you something you may not like? I'm like, oh, crap. OK, I'm getting myself ready. And he says, you're too nice to be a startup CEO. Like, huh. Now, I know this will bug some of you, especially Peter. Like, I'm pretty nice. What's wrong with that? Um, what he was really saying was he didn't think I was results-oriented enough to be a startup CEO. And I listened to him, and I'm like, you know what? I think you're right. And, and it took this weight off the shoulder. I assumed I had to be the CEO of a company before I died. And I'm like, no, I don't have to do that. Like, I could be three to week, day, week product leader. I mean, incredibly helpful insight that really just resonated with me. And this saved me probably five or 10 years of pain in, in working to be a startup CEO, which was my vision at the time. Incredibly helpful. Patty McCord was, uh, she's, she ran HR at, at Netflix, she's got really good ideas. And I would work, walk on the beach with her, and I said, hey, Patty, I'm having a hard time finding non-traditional roles. And she said, Gib, just tell people what you want. So when the recruiters called, I said, OK, I'd like to be your three-day-a-week product leader. 
which felt incredibly audacious. And then somebody said yes. I'm like, oh shit. Incredibly, <laughs> incredibly helpful advice from Patty. Joel Jewett, um, he retired at age 40. Another Amherst College person. And what happened was every morning he would take the kids to school and then he would work out and then he was a drummer. He would drum in the garage. Did this for a whole year and he came home one day and his whole family was around the table and they did an intervention. They said, Dad, you have to go back to work. You're driving us crazy. Okay? And it was Joel said, you know, in these next couple of years, at the end of the day, make sure you fulfill both your social needs, you guys are doing that for me now, and your pur purpose. And my purpose is really around teaching. Incredibly helpful advice. And my family still likes me. Very different from his experience. So this is a sample of all the ideas that people have helped me. And this, again, is my wife, Kristen. She's like, Gib, yeah, for you, it's all about creative pursuit. And so the last year or two, I've just been focused on three things. I write, I do talks, and I do workshops. And that, those are my creative pursuits, and it's incredibly fulfilling for me. And, and of course, husbands and wives or spouses or others, they have good insight about you. And the news flash here is none of us are self-aware. We aren't. We have, like, sometimes we think we're better than we are, and most of the time we think we're worse than we are. So you need this board of directors to fill in the gaps in your knowledge. So your board. You want to establish them when times are good. It sucks if you only come to people when you have problems. So I've been pretty good in good and bad of investing in these relationships. And you need to listen carefully when they speak. I, I can remember these juicy quotes over 20 years because I was a careful listener. And you need to refresh your board very often as you get to different stages in your career or different industries or different challenges that you're engaged in. And no, I don't have a sit down meeting every quarter with my board, but every time I have a big juncture, I do a little email. Hey, this is a summary of the job that I'm thinking about taking. Here's why I'm looking for your insight. That always happens when I shift from one company to the other. If I drop in to Boston, I always visit Langley Steinert, who's one of my favorite entrepreneurs in Boston. Uh, so I keep this up, and about half of them kind of know that they're on my board, and half of them don't really know. But I'll get them to see this talk, and then they'll know. <laughs> OK, so the peers thing. About half of my board is peers. LinkedIn has made it really easy. Uh, and, and I'm really good about keeping up with my former colleagues. And again, LinkedIn makes this really easy to keep up with folks. Peers, they're in similar function, and they tend to be at the same stage or the same kind of company. They help you navigate the monthly, quarterly stuff. It's all about the past colleagues. And you provide mutual support. You help them. You talk about stuff openly, and they do the same for you. The mentors are a little bit different. You're looking for folks with extraordinary judgment. So most of mine, they, they just have great judgment, super helpful. And they have broad skills and network. This is what makes them mentors. And they provide this wonderful balance of being candid and caring about me. So Irv Grossbeck, the buck a year professor at Stanford, he cared enough about me to deliver this hard truth. Like, Gib, you are not going to be a CEO before you die, and that's OK. This is what mentors are great at. So you all want to know how to find a mentor, right? Let me give you my first tip. Do not ask a person to be your mentor. That's the world's most awkward conversation. I probably had two dozen people ask me that. And I try to find a nice way to wiggle out of it, OK? Here's how you do it. You have these weak links. So you notice a bunch of mine went to my teeny little college. That's the weak link. Or you spent time, like Patty and I worked together at Netflix for years. You have this weak link, and then you just keep sort of pulling at it. Because at the end of the day, the mentor relationship there has to be some personality fit. It's, got to, it's not quite as tight as friends, but there's got to be you know, some sort of fit there. And then you have to pass their tests. So uh, th this is John Liu here. He was a data scientist that was very interested in going into product. He was at NerdWallet. He said, hey, Gib, how do I get into product? 
And I said, hey, let's talk about it in a month. Set up lunch in a month. What I was really seeing was whether he would care in a month about this. That was my first little test. <sighs> he was persistent with me. The next thing you have to do is figure out how you can create value for that person. Like, for me, what's incredibly helpful is you'll notice at the end there's an NPS survey. Click on that and give me feedback. I'm always dying for feedback. I'm always trying to stay relevant to understand what's going on in your heads. The, the, the stuff I got tonight about what's going on in your lives via Slido, that's incredibly helpful to me. So John Liu said, hey, Gib, do you have a startup I could spend Saturdays with building stuff? I didn't have any ideas. And we went back and forth. And I said, OK, John, I need somebody to build me a website. And he's like, I'm a data scientist. I don't know how to build a website. I'm like, here, here's my credit card. Go to Squarespace and frickin' build me a website. This is on a Friday. And on Monday, he built me a website. And like he, like he could do it. And I knew he could do it. And he created wonderful value for me. So this baby website still exists. But that's how you form these mentor relationships. And, and, and you will get there. All right, I'm going to bring it home. This is the question. Okay? The thing that's holding you back is fear. And the question I am posing of you is what would you do if you weren't afraid? Give yourself 10 minutes of thought on that this weekend. Think about this. That's really the main thing. And then take action. Do something about it. Don't muddle around with your job sat at four. Don't muddle around for the next 12 or 18 or 24 months. Do something. Take action. All right, so I spent some time nicely reminding you that you're all products. And I'd like you to hack your career the way you would a product. So you can start with thinking about, how do I position myself? How do I use those top two or three skills that I identified as, for me as a product person and as a leader as I grow? And then use that same pr 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 progression ladder to think about how you position yourself. And then think about how you might want to position yourself differently going forward. And thus, you have formed some hypotheses, these potential forks in the road. Is it this or that? And then you begin to experiment, often through side projects. But the, ba the first baby step might be lunch with a data scientist, because you're wicked interested in that. Or you heard about a designer who used to be an engineer. And you're curious about that, too. This is how the side projects and the experiments begin with these simple baby steps. How many of you in the room have a personal board of directors? Did, hands higher? Is it helpful to you? Yeah. OK. The rest of you, OK? Some of your peers are in this room tonight. Okay? Awkwardly reach out your hand and say hello and find out about them. Ask a mazillion questions about them. Right? That's how it begins. Get on LinkedIn and reach out to that person you've been meaning to talk to. Those are the peers. And then think about, gosh, my career hypothesis, I actually want to go into filmmaking. Okay, who do I know that can begin to tell me about filmmaking? Who might be a potential mentor? These things start with these little baby steps. But it's wicked important to begin that. At the end of the day, I want the job sat of everyone in this room to be an eight or above. I want to see an NPS at a world class level of 70. OK? That's all I want of you. All right. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you very much. You guys, like I told you about the consumer science thing, I, I'm a little bit freaky. I'm, and um, I, I've been like doing my thing. Like you, you all had street performers. They do their thing, the crowd's around. And then they do this incredibly stupid thing that makes the crowd disappear. Okay? They pass the hat. And everybody runs. You guys have run from the hat. So this is that really awkward moment. I'm not asking you for money. I would just love some feedback. Okay? So this is my 323rd talk. And all you have to do is pull up your phone as though you're taking a photo using your camera app. 
You don't have to click it, um, but it should magically pop up, hold it vertical, it'll magically pop up a Net Promoter Survey link from SurveyMonkey. And zero is sucky, and 10 is great. You can pick any number on that continuum. And then I'm looking for one idea that was good tonight, something you enjoyed, and one idea about something that would make it better. And, and this is incredibly helpful data and feedback to me. But is it working for you? If you're in the back row, the, the cool kids are turning around to the back monitors, which are a little closer. If you have like Android with, oh, sorry, I'll hold it up for a second more. If you have Android with Lollipop, you just go to the, the website that John Liu built me at www.gibsonbiddle.com, and one of the links on the top of the page is to a net promoter score. Um, so you can go here. I have put the PDF of this presentation ready for you to download. And then I wrote an article on Medium that goes into more detail of all of this to give you those detailed tactics that I know you're looking for. It's called Hacking Your Career. And it's been, it's been read 50,000 times and it's got like 5,000 claps, which maybe that's good, I don't know. I, they, they don't help me to buy skis or anything, but it's good to have claps. All right, so I'm ready to answer questions. I would love it if you would indulge me to ask the hard questions anonymously using Slido. So I'm gonna to try to commit to the tool because I, I actually find the questions are better. Oh, and the other thing is you can go in and you can upvote them and stuff like that, and I'll just work from the top of the list. How am I doing, your, your eye, your eye? I'm doing good? I only got one thumb up. Okay, that's better, yeah. How many stars now? Okay. I'm going to start answering questions. Have you ever had great product managers with little to no technical experience? When and what factors made success possible? Okay, so I'm incredibly sympathetic to this. So um, what happened to me is I interviewed with Yahoo. This is in 2005, a VP product role. And they said I wasn't technical enough. So there I was over at Netflix. The conversations were going along. And I said, gosh, I just want to make sure you know that I'm going to be the one English major in the building with 100 engineers. And they said, that's cool. We're looking for something different. And so that turned out to work well for me. So I'm incredibly empathetic to product leaders that don't have strong technical skills. So yes, I hired um, two of my hires. I was trying to build domain expertise in, movie ma in filmmaking. So I hired two people that were incredibly smart. They'd gone to film school and actually created films. Uh, I thought that they had a uh, consumer science aptitude, like one of them. I was like, how do you make money to feed your kids when you're building a drama? And I know, like, your first film does not want to be a, a drama. You're going to make no money. Do a documentary first, just, just so you know. Um, but he was coaching wealthy LA parents on how to do well in the SAT in both math and verbal. His name is Todd Yellen. He's the VP of product at Netflix today. He did Bandersnatch. Do you guys know it? He won an Emmy. Like, that's cool. Um, anyways, uh, he had incredible skills, domain expertise, and he was great at the consumer science. Uh, and that made him successful without being technical. And he had all those other things I was looking for, intellectual curiosity, he was passionate, he was courageous, he was candid, he was just amazing culture fit with Netflix. Um, so, and then I think most of you know that if you're interviewing, coming through the front door at Google as a product manager, they really want you to be technically oriented. Uh, if you walk into the building, you discover there's a lot of non-technical product managers because they all got bought and they do just as well there. So, who knows? Uh, so I think it's eminently possible. Just focus on your, your other skills and, and figure out how, what are the roles that are a great fit for you. What's a favorite question that you were asked while interviewing for a product leadership role? Oh, my favorite questions are easy ones. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, if you say you're a strong leader, like if you put, if I asked you what your superpowers are and you told me you were an incredible leader, my first question is gonna be, I want you to back that up. So tell me a leadership challenge uh, and how you overcame it. Um, and, and I look for those stories. And I'm usually looking for a little bit of strategic thinking, some of the communication of an important idea. 
and then how they could motivate whole teams to do good. So I have been asked for that. Um, my, my answer was I got bought by Kevin O'Leary and the Learning Company at this startup called Creative Wonders, and within a month, I needed to tell the team that we were all going to move from Redwood City to Fremont, and the, the commute was going to be 30 minutes longer, which would suck. Uh, and none of them really wanted to go. And so the, the leadership challenge was I, I basically came back to the team and I explained the fishbowl acquisition strategy. When you go buy a fish at a pet store, you, don't, you go in and you get the baggie with the fish, and then you don't just dump it into the water right away, because it'll die. You, you lower it into the fishbowl to let it acclimate. So I created this strategy, which was we all went over to Fremont, but for a whole year we got our own building. So we were sort of the baggie. We, it let us adjust. And after a year, we pulled the baggie away, and we all took on much bigger and more aggressive. That was my answer when, when I was asked about leadership at Netflix, and they bought it. Okay? <laughs> it's fabulous. Uri, are you helping me, or am I, am I doing the right thing? It magically went away. Did you do that? Oh, awesome. Do you have, do you have some superpowers? Okay, good. You'll have to teach me that. What did the product org look like just before you joined each of your previous companies? Okay, so just so you know, anytime I come to a company before I showed up, it was a disaster. And then I added a ton of value within three months. Okay? Um, let's see, it depends. Um, so the, the tricky part about Netflix was the average tenure for a VP of product at Netflix before I showed up was three months. Well, that's a little scary. Tell me more. <laughs> And so I did. I, I, what I discovered with Reed Hastings, the CEO, his, if you asked him what his legacy wanted to be, he said this notion of consumer science. That he wasn't cool like Steve Jobs. He couldn't guess the talent or fashion or style. You know, he, he would say, I'm just a geeky engineer. But he was going to build the system of consumer science where you could test anything to really learn what resonated or didn't. That was his idea. The problem was all the whole team there was a starter team. And they didn't embrace the idea of A-B testing or of creating different experiences to see what worked or didn't. And I figured that out. And, and that was why it kept failing. And so I, at that point, I had to make a commitment to building a whole new team uh, over the year, first year, which is really what I did. Um, so there was a lot of radical change. I didn't announce that at the beginning of the year. I just sort of did it little by little over the course of the year. And I was trying to upgrade. Um, Chag, I had to introduce A-B testing data to it. It was different, though. Uh, Netflix is a pro team. We actually built a family at Chegg. So it was, it was uh, like, I didn't do, I, I was not a hard ass at Chegg. Like, at Netflix, I wouldn't hire any interns in the summer. Uh, and at Chegg, I hired, like, 30. It was just a different environment. Um, yeah, I had to do some change there. I actually shifted f to a GM structure, where we had a GM for textbook rentals and a GM for homework help and a GM for ads and sponsorship largely because the CEO was very sales and revenue oriented. And he just wanted to know who's the one throat I'm going to choke on each of those revenue streams. Okay? So these are the kinds of things as a leader, like you have a lot of leverage at figuring out the right organization when you come in. Just, just one thing, most people are like, organizational design is really challenging. My one tip is to treat it as an experiment, which sounds really scary. Um, but you just have to try stuff and see what works. And you can't spend too much time thinking about it. Because uh, as companies grow, you tend to need to reorganize every six or nine months. So if you spend four months talking about it, you're really behind the eight ball. So it's a little scary, but uh, I learned to, to experiment with humans. I'm an evil person. I'm sorry for this. OK, authenticity versus fake it till you make it in the context of product and leadership traits we looked at earlier. So I, I guess hiding behind the question is this notion of imposter syndrome. Um, so, I, so, so first of all, my daughter's 22, and she just started at Rep the Runway. She's three weeks in. Uh, she's like, Dad, I have no idea what my job is. I'm like, yeah, welcome to product management your first year. Like, you're just trying to figure out what the job is. They don't really expect that much from you in the first year. Relax and see what you like and ask a lot of questions and ask for feedback. Um, so I, I can sort of remember that. The way I got over imposter syndrome, I, I used to, my, 
my bosses always thought I was ready for the next rung of the ladder, like six months before I could even imagine it. So I, I would sort of play it safe, and they would, they would say, hey, Gib, I think you're ready. Um, so that was my sort of version of imposter syndrome. It was actually my board of directors that helped me to build the confidence to be more aggressive going forward. Um, so they would help me to lean forward in those different situations. My board of directors helped me. I, I've now bought like 10 companies, and I've been bought three times. And we've spent a lot of time understanding mergers and acquisitions from both sides. My board of directors at the time was amazingly thoughtful about it. And so they, they helped me to be an authentic leader and to be a confident leader, even if I didn't have all the answers, because I was getting good insight from them. It's a great question. Product is taxing mentally and physically. Did you ever consider trading off professional fulfillment with personal life balance? Which other jobs do you consider? OK, so my first 15 years of my career, I would leave a startup on Friday and start at the next one on Monday. And then it was actually a family wonder. We actually sold it to Sega Genesis. It was, honestly, it was not a success. But um, for a bunch of odd reasons, I, I got a check as I left. Okay, And I committed to not work for a year. So that was the first time I took a break, and I loved it. It turned out I was really good at not working. So I would walk downtown in Burlingame, and I was freaking out. There were so many people there at noon. I'm like, where, where did these people come from? I thought everybody worked. Um, so I really loved it. Uh, and I actually uh, taught, uh, I tutored at the kids' school. I mean, all the kids in Burlingame still call me Mr. Biddle. Nobody calls me Mr. Biddle, but it's cute. They're like 24 years old now. Um, that was amazing. And then my wife gave me the list of stuff I had to do, the life maintenance list or the honeydew list. Um, I was good about that. And then I trained for triathlons, which I loved. And I got fast. Um, so after that, the way I did life work balance was I no longer would go leave on a Friday and start on a Monday. I would program in three, six, nine, 12 months. And then I had the audacity later to propose that I could work three days a week, which worked. So that's been my version of life work balance, but it took me 15 years to get to that first experiment. It's kind of reality. Uh, why to only focus on strengths and developing the weaknesses? OK, that's a great question. Um, so for instance, if you have no skills in consumer science, I, I probably won't consider you as a product manager or product leader. Like, I, I just think you have to have some skills to develop consumer insight. Um, now, like for instance, I was substantially stronger at qualitative, at, at un having the voice of a customer in my head through focus groups, through usability. It helped me form ideas and hypotheses. I wasn't uh, as, as great as Reed or others at the A-B testing and setting up tests and analyzing them, et cetera. Uh, but I cared deeply about the notion of consumer science. Um, so that, for instance, if you suck at consumer science and you're interested in product management, I, I think you should do some work there. Um, but like, I, I'm the case, I care deeply about what engineers think and the opportunities that new technologies provide in terms of innovation. But I'm very light technically. And I've actually asked engineers, like, why do you like working with me? Because they do like working with me. And they're like, Gib, you're really good at um, sculpting the path, the vision, and you're really mindful about strategy and staying focused on the right metrics. So they just like that. Um, very personal, uh, and that's how I got over my lack of technical skills. I, so I think the answer is going to be different for all of you. At some point, I thought I wanted to learn finance skills, and that would have been sucky. And I didn't need to learn finance skills in a product leadership role. What's my favorite product? Oh my god, OK, I got way into drones, OK? Uh, and they're just easy enough now that they can do what I want without me like, getting too deep into the weeds. Um, and I love my skis. <laughs> uh, I've got skis that are not too, like, they handle all conditions well. They're all mountain skis. And there's been a lot of innovation in skis in the last 10 years. What was the trigger for leaving your job? Was it sudden or gradual? 
Uh, okay, you have the sudden version, which is you're out of money. Oops, that's sudden. Most of them was gradual. The, the drop from nine to eight to seven to six on your job satisfaction. And that sometimes would play out over a year or two at Chegg. Um, you know, you always want to start at nine. You know, you always, when you come into a new role, you, you just want to assume it's going to be at least a nine because you know they haven't told you the full truth, right? <laughs> um, and so it started at nine at Chegg and then dropped to eight. Um, and then I thought, it, what I slowly remembered in education, everything takes twi twice as long as you thought. And at that point, I actually had the luxury of not having to go to work every day. So that sort of made me obviously braver in choosing stuff. So I, I chose to, to stop working at Chegg and then explore all these experiments that I've done. Um, I've never, you know, like, I've never done the screaming, I quit and left the building. Um, it's just not who I am. Uh, so I would say, you, you know, Chegg, it went from nine to six over a year and a half. And then I just knew, like, it, it was hard to get in the car to go to work every day. That's just the way it felt to me. You speak a lot about strong skills. How should one treat weaknesses? Uh, I sort of said it earlier, which is, if it's a really important skill in the job that you're doing, so for instance, the notion of consumer science as a product manager, um, actually Reed left me a copy of Statistics for Dummies on my desk. <laughs> now, I wasn't that offended because he left it on like 48 other people's desks. <laughs> um, but you can read, you can go talk to experts, um, and that's what, usually what I do. Uh, I actually, the, the, the most efficient way for me to learn has always been teaching. So every Thursday night, like, I would put together my thinking on a topic. So if it was A-B test design, I would uh, figure out, okay, what are all the, the, the things that I need to teach my team? Uh, I used to call it topic de semaine. I used to do it every week. That's bad French for topic of the week. Um, but the way I learned was through teaching. So every Thursday night, I'd go through this discipline of saying, how would I frame a conversation around AI or machine learning or A-B testing? Uh, and that, that was a hack that I've engaged in my whole career. Um, I just, I didn't, you know, now I've had time to reflect on this and I realized, oh, that was a good hack. Uh, and that's really how I learned. It was, it was really helpful to me. When, when should I not, well, okay. When should I not go into product? Hmm, I'm gonna have to piece this one out a little bit. Can somebody give me a little insight, even if it's not your question? Like, is the question is, how, how would I know if, if working in product is not right for me? Is that the idea? Okay, so if you don't like building stuff, like when I'm interviewing candidates, I ask questions like, what have you built? And if I have the candidate that talks about the dinner party they did on Sunday, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. They're a creator, right? Or I built a tree house. I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. This is a creator. Um, so most of the product leaders that I know, they, they like building stuff. And they, you know, whether it's building a product or building an organization or building a company or building an industry, they are inherently builders. And if you don't really think of yourself as a person who loves to build stuff, then you know, that's when it might be good to be in marketing or finance or a bunch of other stuff. I think that would be my little test. I, I often ask people early in their career, by the way, early in your career, you're just trying to figure out like what your skills are and what's you like doing and not like doing. You know, this is my conversation with my 22-year-old daughter. But by the way, she's totally passionate about fashion, and she's at Rent the Runway. Like, that's a great start. Uh, and then she did a summer internship last year, and she loved it. I'm like, that's a freaking great start. And you're working in a company where 70% of the employees are women. This is a great start, Brett. Right? So it looks like a great start to me. Uh, my other kids, uh, she's applying a bit to uh, med school. She, she looks a lot like her mother. So, Could you elaborate on how you built binge watching? What was the biggest challenge? Okay, so we launched uh, uh, streaming in January of 2007. We were a DVD by mail company. The intent was to launch with 1,000 titles and we had 300. The biggest challenge was finding content. It was really that. Uh, and we had no idea where it's going to come from. Those 300 titles were, quote, steamy romance titles. That's, that's customers nicely saying it was porn, which it kind of was. 
So that was the biggest challenge. Uh, it turns out, we just experimented, it, it, and at some point about two years in, we had the insight. Turns out that eight seasons are lost. Like, what do you do? Like, no customer's gonna buy a box set of eight seasons are lost. So we started going to all the TV companies with the episodic TV content, and us paying them money for streaming that stuff was like found money to them. Um, and so, I don't know if you noticed it, but it, Netflix used to be 80% movies and 20% TV, and it flipped for a time period. It was 80% about episodic TV watching and 20% movies, because that's where we could find the content. And original content, for a variety of reasons, it's better to do episodic TV content than a movie. The reason is you, once you invest in characters, you as watchers and story, that can go on for eight seasons, where I joke, nobody wants to watch Rocky 100, but I mean, like they're on like Rocky 30 right now. It's just mind blowing. Okay, I am going to uh, save all of your questions. I'm probably gonna try to answer them like on Medium or something, because I have two nights of questions that are unanswered. Um, so I'm going to reflect on them, and I'm going to do my best to answer all the questions that came in via Slido, which is really the advantage. Thanks a ton for being here tonight. I'm going to hover so you can ask me more questions. Thanks a ton, Job, and yeah, and you can clap now. Thanks, Slido. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I met you last time. Yes, Carolyn. Hey. Nice to see you. Hi. Nice to meet you, Hurry. 